Sri Kumar is an assistant professor of philosophy in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He is a gold medalist for MA Philosophy from the Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam. He did his MPhil and PhD in Philosophy from the Central University of Hyderabad and specializes in the areas of philosophy of language, continental philosophy and hermeneutics. He has been into the academic profession since 1995 and is taught in Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala and Bitspilani, Rajasthan before joining the IIT Midras in 2003. Dr. Sri Kumar has published articles in various journals and has presented papers in national and international seminars. Some of the courses he offers include European Philosophy, Contemporary German Philosophy, Introduction to Indian Philosophy, Philosophical Hermeneutics, Philosophy and Critical Theory and Philosophy of Language. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in philosophy on Phenomenology and Existentialism part 41. We have been discussing about the philosophical importance and the concepts developed by the French phenomenologist Maurice Merleau-Ponty in the previous two episodes. So, we will continue with that particularly focusing on his concept of perception because it is this notion of perception which is very important which occupies a very important place in Merleau-Ponty's philosophical scheme. So, we will continue with this discussion on the concept of perception in this episode as well. So, we will be discussing the primacy of perception which is a concept which is an idea which repeatedly figures in Merleau-Ponty's works. Then problems with empiricism and intellectualism because when you develop when he tries to develop a notion of perception a unique notion of perception he does it by contrasting his notion with the conceptions which were available in the existing traditions particularly the dominant traditions of empiricism and rationalism and various other things which he calls intellectualism. So, we will very briefly mention in this particular episode about these problems then we will see the perspective of phenomenology of perception how he develops how Merleau-Ponty develops his position and it is in this concept we encounter a notion called body subject the concept of body because any theory on perception in the western context at least involves or any theory of perception in the western context needs to explain or tries to provide explanations to the body mind relationship particularly after Descartes. So, we will see how this problem comes in or how Merleau-Ponty encounters this problem and he tackles this or he overcomes this dilemma with a peculiar concept called body subject. And finally, we will see how perception is being conceived as an existential act by Merleau-Ponty. So, first the primacy of perception. Perception according to Merleau-Ponty constitutes the ground level of all knowledge and its study has to precede that all other strata the cultural world and the sciences. So, as far as knowledge is concerned what is the most important thing is perception everything starts with perception. So, it sounds like empiricism here, but in the case of empiricism it is drastically different from empiricism because in the case of empiricism the emphasis is more on ex empirical experience and the analysis of empirical experience into various sections. For example, the concept of sense data which uh, or sense uh, sensor simply these concepts are being encountered by Merleau-Ponty and he denies or he never gives any importance to such conceptions and such fashion of analysis. So, we will see that in the following a unique approach to perception. So, he develops consequently a very unique approach to perception which is again I repeat drastically different from the empiricist conception the classical empiricist conception as well as the contemporary 20th century conceptions of uh, empiricism which develops a theory of perception. So, let us have some background where this notion of perception is discussed in the philosophical traditions. And we would see that though most of the philosophical schools and uh, traditional thinkers have a concept of perception, they, they deal with perception. For example, even we will find this notion in the philosophy of Plato, though Plato says that perception does not take us to genuine knowledge, 
Plato too had a concept of perception. So, perception is such a very important philosophical concept which repeatedly appears and reappears in the history of western philosophy. And, but at the same time this concept of perception occupies a very central role or it becomes a very important philosophical notion with the emergence of uh, empiricism in Britain. So, this is John Locke who is uh, supposed to be the founder of uh, the empiricist school in uh, British philosophy. And uh, John Locke this notion of perception is an imminent theme in uh, the empiricism particularly in the empiricism of John Locke, because he asserted that all knowledge is a result of uh, perception and according to him perception of ideas. Now, again classical empiricism contents of thought are restricted to possible contents of sense experience. So, there is a kind of identification of perception with sense experience and its analysis which is conducted very elaborately by the empiricist tradition both traditional as well as modern and contemporary. John Locke again traces the origin of all human knowledge to sensations and reflections. We have already discussed some of these points in some of our previous episodes. So, I am not elaborating them here, but I just want to assert that the role which sensations and reflections played in Locke's philosophy and Locke's theory of perception. Now, when we come to another very important British empiricist thinker George Berkeley again had a very unique concept of perception and uh, he even went to the extent of saying that to be is to be perceived. So, this is a very controversial statement which is uh, which even came to be known as uh, subjective idealism. Now, let us come back to perception proper, it is not the result of the function of individual organs. So, this is the position which uh, Morley Ponty would be try arguing for, it is not just the result of the functioning of individual organs, it is not a mechanic, it is not the result of a mechanical process that takes place in our body, but then what is it, it is a very organic process what is it, it is a vital and performative human act in which I quote unquote I perceive through the relevant organ. So, what is more important here is not the mechanical process and the so in the language of contemporary sciences perception is nothing but a very complex chemical process biochemical process, but it is more than that if you perceive it or if you try to understand it from a philosophical perspective Molly Pondy argues it is not just a mechanical process, but it is a process it is a performative human act. So, it is from this notion of understanding perception or conceiving perception as a performative human act, he develops the concept of perception as an existential act later, we will see that later. So, it is a vital uh, it is a vital and performative human act in which I perceive through the relevant organs. Each of the senses informs the others in virtue of their common behavioral project or concern with a certain human endeavor and perception is inconceivable without this complementary functioning. So, it is a process which involves various other sense organs and their mutual cooperation. So, there is a common behavioral project involved behind perception. And, uh, but empiricism on the other hand we could see it fails to recognize the complementary functioning of the senses because it is too mechanistic, it is it tries to explain perception or human knowledge in terms of certain atomistic phenomena. So, in that process it fails to recognize the complementary nature function of the senses. And then again the causal explanation model of natural sciences does not work in the case of psychology. So, we are dealing with psychology, we are trying to understand human perception as a psychological phenomena as well. So, when we try to do that we cannot approach the whole phenomena from the perspective of natural sciences which employ causal explanation uh, model. Here scientific and analytic causalities cannot actually appraise meaning and human action. So, we can see here Merleau Ponty introduces a very important term meaning which is so central to phenomenology which is not a very important phenomena as far as empiricism 
is concerned, particularly the traditional empiricist schools are concerned, because meaning comes into picture only when there is something which where there is again in the language of uh, Merleau-Ponty, when perception is conceived as a performative human act, as an existential act, meaning for a man, meaning for us. So, this scientific and analytical causalities with the model of causal explanation cannot actually appraise meaning and human action. So, here there is a quotation from Phenomenology of Perception, Marleau-Ponty's book, I read it. In the first case, consciousness is too poor as far as empiricism and intellectualism is concerned. He is talking basically about empiricism and intellectualism, the two traditions he conceived as opposing or rather he develops his notion of perception and knowledge and phenomenology in opposition to these two traditions, these two dominant philosophical schools empiricism and intellectualism. So, I read the quote in the first case that is in the case of empiricism consciousness is too poor, in the second it is too rich for any phenomenon to appeal compellingly to it. Empiricism cannot see that we need to know what we are looking for otherwise we would not be looking for it and intellectualism fails to see that we need to be ignorant of what we are looking for or equally again we should not be searching. Such it is a very beautiful quotation from uh, Malu Pondi's book which summarizes his criticism against uh, empiricism and intellectualism which ultimately led to the development of a unique notion of perception which constitutes the central core of his philosophy. Now, again as I already mentioned that uh, one important concept which becomes very relevant in the context of uh, any theory of perception is the relationship between subject and object. So, when we talk about this, uh, this peculiar relationship subject object relationship, what Malleponte would say is that he never rejects it, because nobody can reject it. So, he says that the cognitive relations between subject and object exist, but they are not phenomenologically primitive. So, he is only asserting the fact that the cognitive relationship that exists between subject and object, when we, when we are uh, observing something, when we are perceiving something, when we are knowing something which is there in front of us, there is a cognitive relationship that exists between us and the objects in front of us, but this cognitive relationship cannot be conceived as phenomenologically primitive. And phenomenologically primitive in the sense phenomenology looks for things for things in themselves, going back to things in themselves. So, there is something more fundamental than this cognitive relationship that is involved in perceptions that is what is more important for phenomenology. So, they are looking for or all the phenomenologists including Malli Ponti are looking for the most phenomenologically primitive entities. Subject object relationship is a very strong traditional metaphysical conception. I have already mentioned this because uh, the whole tradition of empiricism tries to develop their concept of knowledge and experience in terms of this metaphysical relationship between subject and object. And uh, now we have to see how the phenomenology of perception which uh, Malli Pondi develops deviates from this empiricist perception. So, we are trying to see what is the position developed by phenomenology of perception of Malli Pondi via our bodies. So, here there is a very clear deconstruction of this mind body dualism. He says that we are our bodies and that our lived experience of this body denies the detachment of subject from object, mind from body etcetera. So, there is a very it is not a close link we cannot even call it as a close relationship or a close link, because even to call that uh, there is a very close relationship between mind and body assumes that mind and body are separate, but here he even goes to the he is examining or rather he is exploring the notion of I who am I and uh, he says that I am my body and that is not to identify the individual with his physical body. So, he, what he says is that we are our bodies and that our lead experience of this body denies the detachment of subject from object, because we are so intimately related to the world through experience through perception. So, we are engaged in or the world is given to us in, in our perceptions of uh, the world. So, we cannot really separate the mind from the body. 
and again asserts the embodied status of being. So, this is a very unique concept the embodied status of uh, being of man I am my body. So, he goes to the extent of even asserting that I am my body. Those aspects of our life which are called mental are inseparable from our bodily situated and physical nature. Can we really separate those mental phenomena from our situatedness, from our physical nature, from our bodily situated nature? No, this is what Marlipondi asserts. So, because of that therefore, I am my body. Again the perceiving mind is an incarnated body. So, when we talk about if you are really particular about reinventing the notion of mind, then it is nothing but the incarnated body. Again he enriches the concept of body to allow it to both think and perceive. So, there is a thinking body, the concept of a thinking body which is directly in contrast to the, the philosophical position of Descartes, because we have seen it earlier, we have uh, already examined this earlier. When Descartes made his analysis of uh, thinking substance, he says that it is a thinking substance and thinking substance is nothing but the mind. The body is something which cannot think and he conceived body as diametrically opposite to mind, because mind is the entity that which has the ability to think, but body cannot think. The attribute of mind is thinking and body is essentially not a body some the very conception of body is that it cannot think a substance that cannot think. But here he enriches the concept of body in contrast to or in contradiction to Descartes we could see that Malapondi enriches the concept of the body to allow it to both think and perceive. Again hence the individual is not simply a body, but a body subject. So, the concept of body subject is developed because the, the notion of subjectivity is under question and this is the problem with which Descartes also toiled with. Because according to Descartes again there is a subject, the subject is primarily identified with the thinking substance or mind. Now, what about the body? The body is different from that. So, subject is different from that, body is the subject's body, subject owns it, but it is never identical with that. But here with this concept of incarnated body, Merleau-Ponty says that the individual is not simply a body, but a body subject, even subjectivity is attributed to body. Subjectivity is normally attributed in traditional philosophy to the mental substance, but here he, he does it to the body or rather the body subject. So, that there is no assertion on body as such, body the concept of body in a sense in a very broad sense incorporates or encompasses both body and mind. So, now with this idea in background let us have this contrasting approaches towards perception in tradition. We have already seen this that uh, Spiegelberg one of the contemporary commentators on uh, phenomenological tradition analyzes the notion of perception and he compares this notion of perception Merleau-Ponty's notion of perception with uh, uh, another very prominent British philosopher who had developed a theory of perception, very important theory of perception H. H. Price. So, it is a major difference according to Spiegelberg between these two approaches to perception is the absence of any discussion on the notion of sense data, sensa or sensibilia. Because the British empiricist tradition even to the contemporary representatives of this uh, British empiricist tradition, these concepts sense data, sensa or sensibilia they are so central for and knowledge for their philosophy, but Malle Ponti has a totally different view. For example, this is uh, the picture of a tomato and uh, Price an empiricist would describe it as a sense datum of a tomato as red patches of a round and somewhat bulgy shape standing out from a background of other color patches and having a certain visual depth. See how mechanically these people the empiricist tradition has understood perception. So, perception if you conceive it in this fashion loses all its organic nature, it ceases to be a human act a man perceiving it. Rather they are trying to understand the very act of perception even by separating it from the man, because the very moment you attach any act with a man then his historicity comes, 
various other relationships, cultural, social aspects, political aspects, all these aspects would become relevant. In order to keep all these aspects irrelevant and to see the thing in itself, the empiricist tradition would separate the act of perception from the person who perceives it and tries to understand it by analyzing what the act actually consists in. A tomato as all of us know is a red object and they understood tomato as this red patches of round and somewhat bulgy shape standing out from a background of other color patches and having a certain visual depth. So, here for Molu Ponti this is there is no such thing as prizes meaningless data. So, he argues for perception being an existential act of a person from a context. So, all this makes Merleau-Ponty's analysis drastically different from the analysis of the empiricist tradition, a tradition which also again which also considered perception as so central to philosophy and human concerns. So, Merleau-Ponty argues for a return to phenomena and here phenomena is not constituted by these sense data, but are something which in the phenomenological sense directly given to us. So, phenomenology of perception is an attempt to explore the basic stratum in our experience of the world as it is given prior to all scientific interpretation. Here we could see that he reflects Husserl considerably, Husserl also talks about things that are given directly to our consciousness which is uh, prior to all scientific interpretation of this particular object. So, things which are directly given to us that is what is important. So, phenomena back to things themselves here perception is our privileged access to the stratum. So, it is here he places perception in this context where things are given prior to all scientific interpretation there comes perception and it is our privileged access to the stratum. The aim is to see and describe how the world presents itself to perception. So, the whole process is reversed how the world presents itself to perception. It is not that you understand or we understand the world from our perspective the subjective pole or the, the, the inner space approaching the outer space and trying to understand it. Rather here how the world presents itself to perception is more important. So, it is a phenomenology of the world as perceived. So, it is not just a phenomenology of perception, but a phenomenology of the world as perceived because I repeat the aim is to see and describe how the world presents itself to perception. Now, return to phenomena which is the most original phenomenological project back to the perceived life world. So, he calls for a going back to the perceived life world and uh, to this phenomenological project there are two important obstacles which we have already seen in uh, the some of the previous slides. One is empiricism and the other one is intellectualism. So, these two obstacles or analysis and discussions of these two obstacles keep coming in uh, Melupondi's philosophy when he develops his various positions. So, these two things we can see are uh, he calls them prejudice of the world it both empiricism and intellectualism are understood as prejudices of the world and uh, there is a common view though apparently these two these two positions these two approaches towards knowledge empiricism and intellectualism apparently are opposites they are different, but what Merleau-Ponty says is that there are certain common assumptions which uh, prompt us to categorize them together. So, that is one of the one of such prominent prejudice or one of such prominent common assumption is uh, the prejudice of the world which believes that or which assumes that of a pre given objective world consisting of a meaningless sense data which form the phenomena of perception. So, there is a belief in a pre given objective world consisting of meaningless sense data and again it assumes that each objective stimulus is connected with a sensation in a one to one relationship. There is a notion of representationalism that underlies their conception about knowledge, about world, about experience and about truth. So, this is problematic because they assume that objective stimulus is connected with a sensation in a isomorphic manner one to one relationship. And it is in this context we could see that he places 
is notion of body. Again we are revisiting this concept, because it becomes relevant here, body as man's characteristic access to the world. Again the body subject, the concept of body subject is being highlighted here. As I have already mentioned earlier, the philosophical traditions fail to recognize its importance and tradition widely conceived the body as an object, which is something which is common for both the tradition, both empiricism as well as intellectualism. Body is being conceived as an object. Since body is conceived as an object, it is easy for them to conceive the mind as a subject or rather they are forced to conceive the mind as a subject, because body remains as an object. And uh, this leads to a kind of uh, body mind dualism dichotomy, which Merle Ponty criticizes. With this we will uh, wind up this episode, but before that let us summarize the topics which we have seen today in this episode. We have seen the way Merle Ponty develops his notion of perception, the unique notion of perception Merle Ponty has, which is different from the notions of perceptions advocated by other traditions, the dominant traditions of empiricism and intellectualism. So, he has a unique concept of perception, we have seen how he developed it. Again uh, the criticism of empiricism and intellectualism is very central, it is a very important theme in Merle Ponty's philosophy, we have seen how these themes revisit in his uh, scheme of things. Then again criticism of mind body dualism and uh, the importance he has given to body. So, these are the themes which we have discussed in the present episode. Now, students can take up the following questions. Number 1, how does Merle Ponty oppose the mind body dualism? Number 2, in what way does Merle Ponty's notion of perception differ from that of empiricism? And number 3, what place does the notion of body have in Merle Ponty's philosophy? With this we will wind up this episode, thank you.